Okay, so the question is which data structure to use and when. Well, I'll give you some basic ideas to keep in the back of your mind as you go through the rest of the semester. Uh, different data structures will have very different performance characteristics. And by uh, performance, when we're talking about measuring the efficiency and efficacy of data structures, usually we're talking about the time and space that they um, uh, take when you're executing them. So time, as I said, is the uh, amount of um, uh, cycles that are involved in actually processing <clears throat> a certain amount of data. We usually talk about n being the number of elements as a metric. And um, space would be the amount of space, particularly the amount of extra space that's taken up in order to um, use a particular data structure and particular set of algorithms. Um, each of these structures that we were mentioning before um, can also have variations. And in um, that case, the uh, and also algorithms can also have variations, as we'll see with sorting. Uh, there are many different kinds of algorithms, and they can have very different behaviors under different conditions. The conditions um, could be, uh, well, the, the most obvious condition is how large is the amount of data that they're processing. And that's going to be one very important metric that we'll use to figure out how effective or efficient these are. But another one has to do with the data distributions. And by that, I mean um, not only if you have n number of uh, data elements, what is the distribution of their values? So for example, if it's n integers, does it make a difference if they are all um, uh, you know, near one, so that the, the vast majority are somewhere around the value one? Uh, does it make any difference if they're sorted does it make any difference if they're sorted in ascending order versus descending order? So you can see that the, the way that the data is actually presented and, the, and the, the range that it occupies also has an input, um, as we'll see, particularly in sorting algorithms. The um, picking of a particular data structure, obviously it has to have been implemented either it's available in the language that you're using or in some library that the language um, <clears throat> uh, comes with or, or is available for it. Um, so it has to exist in the form that you're looking for. Otherwise, of course, you have to then possibly implement it yourself. Um, and if it does exist and you have uh, knowledge of the specific implementation, um, which again, as I said, is not something that you normally need to know, but in the case of comparing things, you might actually want to know that underlying this particular type of data structure is one scheme of storage and access versus another kind. There are many cases where the same uh, ADT can be implemented using internally other data structures and in some cases the choice of the data structure used to implement them can have implications. Um, and so you might want to know that. And uh, of course not every um, uh, set of routines is coded as well as others. So <clears throat> in fact maybe that has something to do with your choices too. The Categories of operators that an ADT normally um, uh, will contain, these are the behaviors that an ADT um, is going to offer, uh, can be classified under uh, several different types. One is the constructor, um, like if you're familiar with C++, Java, those are uh, the, uh, when you create an object from a class that uses a constructor, there are also destructors in that case too. Um, but from our point of view of ADTs, constructors will create new instances of the data structure. There are transformers. This will change the internal state of an object. These are sometimes called mutators or setters. Um, if you have a uh, variable inside of an object, a member, a data member, um, you might have a pair of these. You'd have a getter and a setter. 
uh, the setter would actually allow you to change to update the value from the outside. So any kind of change is um, called a transformer. Uh, observers, these do not change things. They look at the state of the object. They come in different kinds. There are predicates which will answer questions for you. You know, is empty, is full, um, is bool, is, uh, you know, is uh, valid or whatever it is. Those are predicates. Um, as I said, the opposite of, of setters or getters. These are sometimes called accessors. <clears throat> so if you've done programming before, you'll often um, uh, C++ or or uh, class-based programming, you'll often have seen um, if you want the access to a member, um, a data member inside of an object, you might have, and if let's say it's called uh, price, you might have two methods available to you, uh, get price and set price. So the first one would, the set price would be a transformer, uh, and then the get price would be an observer. Uh, and summaries, those might be um, uh, other kinds of, let's say, statistical um, computations that are done about the uh, um, total value of something or the um, uh, some other kind of statistical average or mean or standard deviation. Uh, there are many different kinds of those, but the point is they don't make changes. They simply provide information. And then the fourth kind of operation is called an iterator. An iterator is the thing that allows you to process the data's uh, elements in a consistent way in some kind of sequential fashion. So effectively, as we'll see in the standard template library in C++, the, one of the types of uh, entities that is in there are a whole bunch of iterators that allow you to iterate through the contents of um, a list or iterate through the contents of a queue or iterate through the um, nodes in a tree, etc. So those are all <clears throat> uh, essentially they're, uh, they're objects in and of themselves which provide access to other kinds of objects. <clears throat> so um, a little bit more about the internals of how these objects might be uh, put together. Um, a composite data type would store a collection of components under one name and allow you access to the individual components. There are two kinds of these. One is unstructured, so the components are not organized inside of the um, uh, or with regard to each other, that is, classes are unstructured vis-a-vis -vis each other, versus structured. Here, the components um, uh, in the data type are organized, and it affects how they are accessed. So, in other words, an array of, um, of uh, values <clears throat> is intrinsically tied to how the array is laid out and how you access it. <clears throat> So um, you'll notice I have these uh, slides labeled C++ note. Sometimes I'll digress a little bit into C++ as it bears on the topics that we're talking about. So here's an ex uh, example of one of those. Um, when we talk about classes and structs, you know from your C, C++ programming that there are two um, data collection types um, that are um, part of uh, C++. Uh, structs, this is the original C struct uh, data type, and what those are is they allow you to create entities made up of other composite um, things so that you can represent a student by their name and their ID number um, and uh, their hair color, etc., and call that a student. So if you have something like that and you don't care whether all of the data members inside that struct entity are public, that is, they can be seen and changed, um, then you can use a C or C++ struct um, type to uh, represent that thing. Um, so this is the big difference between structs and classes is that all members in a struct are public by default. So there's no sense of encapsulation in that sense and that it can't protect itself. However, classes um, 
which is another kind of unstructured collection, um, is just the opposite. All the data members are private by default. That is, nothing is accessible unless you make it accessible. Um, all the valid client operations on that private data um, are defined as public member functions. So again, if you want something to be public, <clears throat> either a data member itself, which is not a good idea, I'll just mention that, um, or a, um, a method which allows access to a data member, um, then you have to specifically define that as public. So this uh, class is really the embodiment of uh, encapsulation uh, as a concept in C++. Now, we'll talk about another concept. This is another bit of terminology you see in data structures, this idea of a record. A record is a finite collection of elements. Um, those elements are members or fields. Um, so in the case of here's a struct, like you would see in C or C++, this is, um, we call this car type. That's the, uh, the type of struct that we're defining. It has three members in it, a year, which is an integer, a maker, of, uh, which is an array of characters of length 10, and a price, which is a floating point number. Uh, and in this case, we are actually going to create one of these structs as a, a variable that we can then uh, manipulate, and we'll call that my car. So that's what that is saying. <clears throat> Such members, um, uh, year, maker, price, uh, in a struct are accessed directly using named selectors, that is, uh, dot notation. So if it's uh, my car dot price, that is the price of that particular struct um, uh, that has been stored in the price member of that particular my car struct. Um, <clears throat> you can also use these things on the, um, these dot notations on the left hand side of an equal sign and that's what allows you to set a value. So if you say my car dot year equals 2016 then that is an example of using it on the left hand side. But you'll notice that there's no protection there at all. That's everything is publicly available, everything is changeable. So if we talk about records, we can look at the um, data there from those different levels, the application level, etc. Um, so a record at the application level collects related data into one of these structure things. Um, or a class. Um, it's often used to implement other data structures underneath and uh, referring back to that struct that we defined on the previous slide, um, here's an example from an application level of exactly what we were talking about. Here's uh, the my car thing um, which is a, a struct in C++, a particular one that we defined. Uh, it's going to have a year value, a maker value, and a price value. Um, that is year member, maker member, price member. And each of those will have values that we assign to it. Now again, um, we are not looking at the implementation level when we're talking about this here because in fact how these uh, ints versus chars versus floats get stored is a very different level below this. Uh, here we are looking at again from the higher level, an application or logical level. At the implementation level, those records will occupy some chunk of memory. Um, the, uh, this kind um, is located, uh, each member in that um, record is located at some offset from the beginning of the record in memory. So essentially when you say my car, what my car is is really an address in memory <clears throat> that you're going to use as a, uh, a point of reference and then you will calculate where you can find year, where you can find maker, where you can find price based upon that address and some offset from it. Normally speaking, you don't have to worry about this at all, okay? This is all handled for you by the compiler and the runtime system of whatever um, tools you're using. <clears throat> so in this case, the physical implementation is structured, as you can see, but the logical view is not, as we just saw previously. So when it gets down to the nitty-gritty of what's really going on, 
uh, if you have a struct, you know, the, a struct car type, it'll have those three members, year, maker, price. Um, it will have a particular length in memory. And then in order to find if you have the address of a particular um, car type, like my car, um, that you created, then you would have that address. And you could then find where the year is, where the maker is, and where the price is by calculating uh, based upon that um, originating address and then the lengths um, of each of those things so that you can literally find each one in some contiguous chunk of memory as long as you have all that information. Where does it start? How big is each one? Etc. So pretty, pretty obvious, but it's, now you can see we're at a very low level here. So let's talk about two different kinds of records that are um, kind of the basis for a lot of other things that we use. Um, the array, a one-dimensional array, is probably as simple as you're going to get as in terms of uh, data structures. Uh, <clears throat> a one-dimensional array will store a collection of similar elements in some contiguous chunk of memory. Um, again, all the arrays that we're talking about are homogeneous, one data type. Um, and the ADT operations on them are basically, and you can extend these, but these are the simplest ones, <clears throat> is um, you create, you can create one of these things, and then you can access the elements in it. So at a very high level. At the logical level, you get into a little bit more detail, but not implementation detail. Um, in terms of what we're going to call static arrays, that is, um, ones that can't grow or shrink. Um, those would be dynamic. We can talk about those separately at some point. But uh, the standard static arrays are finite. They have a fixed size. They're ordered. Uh, and uh, they're ordered by their locations in memory implicitly. And they are homogeneous so that they neither shrink uh, nor, nor grow. Um, and they're all one type. Um, what these things, these arrays do is they allow you to get direct access, random access, again, because if you know what the um, uh, starting point is and you know what the offset is, um, which is indicated here um, uh, at a logical level by the index, um, the subscript that you would use in, in normal uh, C++, then um, that will allow you to, at a logical level, know what position it is in the array. It doesn't say literally where it physically is in memory. That's at an implementation level. <clears throat> but it allows you from a logical level to say what is the offset from the beginning of the array. Um, is it uh, you know, position 1 or 100 or you know, 10,000 or whatever it is? So uh, at a logical level, you can put things into such a, a, a collection. You can find things. Uh, you can uh, traverse uh, in order to find things. And then you can erase things from it, too. So you can modify it. But in, in terms of this, you can't grow and shrink it at will. That would be some another kind of uh, structure. Um, so at the implementation level, now when we're talking um, at the guts, in this, in this case, arrays are primitives in languages like C++. So you don't um, really know, unless you want to look at how the compiler works, <clears throat> exactly how this is done. But essentially, when you declare an array in your code, it's going to, at compile time, which is before it runs, statically figure out um, how big it is, um, what the offsets are, uh, etc. And that is done before your code actually ever executes. So I'm sure you've seen all this before. You've coded in C, C++ before. Here's a uh, string buffer of uh, five um, chars. Uh, these are the C chars. There are, of course, C++ has a string, um, which is, you know, is pretty, um, uh, is superior to the chars, but there's a lot of code that still uses single characters in arrays to represent strings. <coughs> um, the um, second one is, oh, here's our car type struct. So here is a um, an array, a 1D array of um, car type um, entities, as you saw what they looked like. 
uh, of size 100. <clears throat> that we can then, uh, so we can have 100 different cars, each of which has got a, a year or a maker and a price. Um, and just, uh, just to, I'm sure everybody remembers this, but in fact, in C and C++, um, the indices or the subscripts are zero based. So index zero is the first element, index one is the second element, etc. Easy to forget, but um, in fact, most um, languages that I'm familiar with are zero based in terms of array accessing. So at an implementation level, you need to calculate uh, the offset from the base address, which is the beginning of the array of these things, and then use that address to do a calculation that looks something like this. So if you need the address of a particular element, <clears throat> which would be in this case element uh, you know, 1 or 10 or 32, um, that would be the subscript uh, of in the array. That would be the base address plus um, that index value. And um, you know, so it would be 1 or 2 or 32 times the size of that whole element so that you can then figure out how far away is uh, that particular element in your array from the base address. And that's how you could uh, uh, calculate how to find it in memory. And again, as I said, you don't ever need to see this, but you should appreciate that this is actually what's going on at the lowest level. <clears throat> so in a sense, um, here's a perfect example of uh, how an abstraction makes a big difference because if you didn't have the abstraction of one-dimensional arrays available to you, then you would have to do this kind of figuring out yourself, and you'd have to know how it's stored internally uh, in order to uh, manipulate these things. Um, and just as an aside, of course, in C++, there's the concept of pointers which allow you to do this same kind of um, address manipulation um, using a um, uh, address arithmetic instead. So in the case, here's, here would be a different kind of a struct. Um, this struct, let's say, has um, uh, different uh, elements in it. It has a, uh, an array of something called data, which appears to take up one location. Um, there would be 110, uh, uh, let me say 100, oh, I'm sorry, there would be 10 of those. <clears throat> um, and then next to it would be um, some money entity. This is a second array. In this case, they take up uh, two locations. So this would be the size of these things are bigger than the size of each of the data elements. And then the third thing is this one is called letters, so maybe this is a char. In this case, we're back to saying um, that they take up one memory location, but you see how they could be stored contiguously in memory um, because you have to define them ahead of time. Uh, so the first array has got 10, second one has got um, six things in it, and the third thing has got uh, 26 things in it. Um, so um, that's uh, essentially how we would map down at the lowest level uh, from something, some um, um, single dimensional array to an actual memory address. <clears throat> now, two dimensional arrays, so essentially an extension of that same idea that are used very heavily for uh, tables. So tabular data, usually you think of this in rows and columns, um, and it's also known as a two-dimensional matrix. And the plural of that is matrices, usually, or matrixes, but matrices, like index and indices. Um, so here's an example at uh, application level. Um, it's um, Oscar time coming up. And uh, let's say we've got um, movie reviewers reviewing different movies with a, um, an integer rating scheme. So a two-dimensional table or matrix uh, would be perfect for storing this. Each row would be a, represent a different reviewer, and each column would be a different movie that they reviewed. <clears throat> You can also think of this as an array of arrays. For example, a 2D array, uh, one way to think of it is, is, is a one-dimensional array of references to, or pointers to, another 1D array. 
So the first element in the first array uh, would represent the row, which would point at a second array, which would represent all the columns in that row. Um, again, the operations are simple. You need to be able to create these things and need to be able to get at them. Um, so very simple in, in terms of uh, what uh, the semantics are. Um, Again, in our view of these records, the two-dimensional array is finite, uh, fixed size, um, again, homogeneous uh, elements, uh, except that it now, instead of having a single um, dimension, it has two, um, so essentially a width and a height rather than simply a length. <clears throat> um, in terms of how we access them, usually uh, there's a um, multiple subscripting um, is the way that we uh, get at the second dimension. So if the table is made up of rows and columns, then you would, uh, the first position um, of uh, table zero, um, column zero, would be table zero, zero. That's the first element in this table from row, the first row in the first column. Um, here's an aside from, um, in terms of C++, um, you, if you're going to um, uh, use these uh, two-dimensional tables, if you're passing them in term in uh, side of of uh, functions, then um, you can get away without having to include the size of the first dimension, but you always have to include the size of the last dimension. And just to to extend this. Um, there's nothing to say that you can't have three dimensions or four dimensions or whatever um, <clears throat> um, in uh, the uh, these kinds of arrays. Um, in that case, always the last one will always have to be specified. Again, just a little C++ note there. Um, so where would you use such a thing? Here's a perfect example. Um, if you had a map, that's a grid that's often thought of as... Uh, um, having two dimensions, a rows and columns, or longitude and latitude, um, positions, um, something like that. In terms of the uh, movie rating, back to that other example, <clears throat> if you um, had a, a rating table, that rating table would point at the first element in the, um, the two-dimensional table. You would refer to them by their row and column position, so if you look at the left-hand side here, rating 0, 2, that would be row 0, column 2, um, and you would be setting it um, uh, to the value of 2. Rating 1, 3, that's a, a second reviewer. Um, the uh, third movie that, or I'm sorry, the fourth movie, because everything, again, is 0-based, that they reviewed would have a value of 8 in this case. So you can see how the, uh, the actual storage um, from a logical point of view is, is thought of. <clears throat> At the implementation level, usually they're stored as a single contiguous piece of memory. Um, the usual uh, scheme for doing this is what's called row major order. Um, in particular, in C++, they're stored row by row in consecutive memory locations. Um, a, um, in general, an, uh, what you would call an n by m array um, uses uh, n by m times the size of the elements that are stored in the two-dimensional array amount of memory. So you can get a handle on how big it is or how, how much space it takes up. Um, in this case, in row major order, the first m cells would hold the contents of the first row, and then you would have the second m cells of the next row, and the third m cells are uh, the next row, and so on like that. Um, in some other um, uh, languages, you might see column major order, which would be simply the same idea but flipped the other direction. Okay. Um, so here, just to give you uh, something a little bit more tangible to hang on to, so the 1D uh, array in memory, here's something, here's a, um, an array of, uh, of uh, roles of uh, something, I don't know exactly what, um, it's not dice, but um, whatever it is, <clears throat> um, you can see it is eight elements long, 
okay, from zero through seven. The values are, in this case, are integer values that seem to apparently take up two memory locations because you can tell by the addresses, the first address, which would be the value of um, roll, um, it would be address 1000. The next element <clears throat> is two locations away, 1002, the next one 4, 1006, 1008, etc. So you can tell that they're two locations long each. Um, and so that's that's fairly obvious. Um, the uh, um, uh, one of the ways of storing two-dimensional data would be simply uh, something like this. Here we have a um, uh, an array called S, a two-dimensional array. <clears throat> so it's referred to by its row and column uh, subscripts. So you can tell that it has. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 rows, which is 4 rows, and it has um, uh, 0, 1, um, uh, 0 and 1 uh, columns, so 2 columns. So in this case, if you uh, look at how the, the indexes work, um, you'll see that the, the rows um, are made up of, of uh, columns of the two columns. So the very first position, <coughs> the, the address of which is 65508 in memory, um, is um, uh, 00, zero okay? row 0, column 0. That has the value of 1234. Then two positions over in memory, that's the difference between 65508 and 65510, um, is a another um, value in the array, <clears throat> in the two-dimensional array, which would be at row zero, column one, that would be 56. So that would be representing all of column, uh, I'm sorry, all of row one. Then right next to it, because these are fixed, again, these can't shrink and grow, so you can, the compiler can figure out exactly how to lay this out. Then you would have row one, column zero, row one, column one, then next is row, uh, 2, 0, 2, 1, 3, 0, 3, 1, and that would represent the two dimensions of the array um, stored contiguously one, right a uh, one row right after the other physically in memory. Um, <clears throat> more sophisticated um, is this, uh, what I mentioned before, another way of thinking about this, and this gives the uh, compiler writer a little bit more flexibility of how to lay things out. The first dimension, let's say the rows, um, you'd have n rows at the top there, and what the uh, rows could contain are uh, essentially pointers to other arrays. Uh, this is the array of arrays concept, uh, each of which represents a column. So on the top there, that points, in other words, when I say points, it means it contains the address of the beginning of the array that it's pointing at. <clears throat> so if the row array is at the top, each one of its elements is pointing at the beginning of its column, um, uh, or its columns, I'm sorry. So um, the second dimension, the M dimension here, are the columns. So you see, this is actually a little more sophisticated um, and maybe a little more uh, realistic because, it, as you can imagine, what it does is it allows the compiler writer not to have to find large contiguous chunks in memory, um, but it would allow them to um, uh, take each column and put it someplace different and simply have the uh, address pointers in the, uh, the row array at the top point at the beginning of each one. A little bit more flexible, a little bit more realistic, perhaps. But both ways are actually used in implementations. <clears throat> Another C++ note in passing, um, because these kinds of things come up in, in having to do with arrays and, and other um, uh, function calls. Um, C++ uh, supports three different ways of passing arguments to, to methods <clears throat> by value. That is, if you look at the function at the bottom, that's the um, declaration for the function, func. Um, it's, it takes three int things. The first one, a, is by value. That is, it's going to make a copy of whatever um, the is passed into it. And um, the, um, 
function internally will not be able to manipulate the actual value passed in, but it simply now has a copy of whatever that was. Then you've got by reference, which is um, that uses the ampersand, <clears throat> and that says it's essentially uh, a memory location of the argument. So in this case, it doesn't make a copy of whatever B was um, being passed in. It actually says, um, I'm going to make an alias, which is really what um, reference um, arguments are <coughs> um, in C++. I'm going to make an alias, and then you can operate internally func on this thing you call B, and any changes you make to B will be reflected in whatever was um, uh, B was referring to when it was called. And then the third kind by reference is a const reference. Now many times you do not want to allow the function or method to change the values of the things that you're passing in. Um, and what you can do is um, uh, by prepending the uh, syntax const for constant, uh, in front of it, you can say, um, yes, this is a reference variable, um, this thing called C that I'm going to be using inside of func um, <clears throat> is a uh, reference variable that's an alias for something um, that it was called with, but you're not allowed to make changes to it internally within func. Um, so that's, that's a good idea to keep these things in mind. Uh, one point to make is um, and this is like C programming. <coughs> Excuse me, arrays are always passed by reference in C++, and they don't need the ampersand to, don uh, to denote that. So beware of that. <coughs> um, another C++ uh, note, implementing ADTs in C++, um, it uh, has a lot of support for creating ADT implementations. Obviously, the class concept is useful. It also, the classes have the ability to uh, hide things using private, um, has the ability to expose things using public interfaces. Um, and uh, by the way, protected is a form of private that has to do with uh, inheritance, which we'll uh, get into a little bit as we go along here. <clears throat> so what is a class? A class is an unstructured type that encapsulates data components along with the functions that manipulate them. Um, so the uh, ADT operations represented by the class type are member access and assignment. You can have more operations, and matter of fact, most classes actually do uh, have more um, operations, but those are the basic ones. A class specification, what is the class actually doing? <clears throat> it's describing the data fields and the functions that the class represents. Um, and that specification is what the application programmer sees as the interface to it. Um, typically in C++, <clears throat> the classes are defined in header files, .h or HPP or HXX files, uh, depending upon your setup. Uh, and the, um, the actual implementation of the class is actually often um, in a separate uh, .cpp or cxx file, which would be the C++ source code. Um, the nice thing about all this is client programmers can focus on using the class without actually ever really knowing how it works. Um, which is really the whole point of this whole lecture, in a sense, is, is understanding that concept. Um, the people who actually define the classes and actually write the classes can then implement them um, uh, in many, many different ways as long as the public interface that they expose uh, doesn't change. <clears throat> um, and as long as that's true, then um, they should be able to protect the investment of whoever uses um, that particular class. <clears throat> when you're doing implementation, you have to define all the member variables, the constructors, any other public method that is exposed. You should make clear which are which of the members is private versus um, which of those are public. In fact, you have to really. 
otherwise everything would be private. If you had a class where everything was private, um, in a sense it really wouldn't, uh, except in kind of special cases where you have classes inside of other classes defined, um, it doesn't make too much sense because if you have a class that has no public interface, then what can you do with it? Um, um, and it's not that this doesn't ever make sense, but generally speaking, that's uh, not something that you you um, you would expect to see. <clears throat> uh, when you're defining classes, you need in C++ to use the scope resolution operator, which is the double colon there, to indicate that the method um, uh, function belongs to a particular class. So here we have a class called date type and the method is called getMonth, and it will return um, uh, a const uh, int. Um, little jargon about classes in C++. Um, a lot of this we've used already. Uh, a variable created from a class definition is called an object. So uh, classes and objects are different things. A class is essentially the, the abstract template <clears throat> for an object. And it's only when the object gets created does it become an object from a class definition. Um, and and uh, we can also call it an instance of the class. So uh, constructing or creating an object from a class definition um, using a constructor is called instantiation. That's a term I happen to use a lot. Um, internal class variables are the data members. The class functions are called methods. And the application software that uses <coughs> these class definitions is called a client. So that's the application programmer uh, viewpoint. Client code has to, in C++, uh, include the class definitions and the class um, implementations in order to be able to use these things. They can only access the public methods of uh, these objects. Anything that's marked as private or protected or hidden from view. Um, and then, uh, and this is in red and underlined and boldface because um, normally speaking, any data members in general, should never be directly accessible from outside the class. And what I mean by that is, as opposed to the struct, where we used dot notation to be able to get at the members inside of the struct, here you should never really be able to do that. You should never allow users of your objects to, to do that. If they want to get the value of a member, there should be a, uh, a getter. Uh, if they want to set the object, uh, the uh, value of a member, you should provide them, and that's legal to do, you should provide them with a setter. <clears throat> so um, if you keep the objects as, um, as uh, shielded as much as possible and provide only those things that they need to provide to the outside world in general, that's a much, much, much better design than allowing... Um, yeah, too much to be exposed because really what you don't want to do is break that encapsulation concept. Um, one thing you'll notice if you use objects is this concept of self. That's a keyword. You don't usually need to qualify member names inside of the class met methods themselves. So, for example, if a class has a data member called foo, then the name foo in a function internal to that class refers to the object's field uh, named foo. So you don't have to do anything special. However, sometimes from inside of an object, you need to refer to the object itself, not a data member inside the object. In that case, then we have this keyword called self, which then allows you to get access to the, um, the, the object as an entity rather than simply the things inside of itself. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, you'll see that and may need to, to use that occasionally when you're writing <clears throat> classes. Now I'm going to step back for a minute and talk about some other class-related concepts that I think are important that you'll see when you're uh, looking at C++ code or that you'll need to understand in order to write your uh, data structures and your uh, exercises. <clears throat> One of the important concepts in object-oriented programming is this idea of inheritance. 
A class can inherit properties, that is, all the datas and methods, from other classes. So basically what that does is it allows you to create a hierarchy of classes that are based upon each other. The base class is the parent that's being inherited from. The derived class, this is more jargon, is the child that inherits from the parent. And basically the idea is that a derived class is more specialized and typically has more fields. Um, a child can in turn be a parent of something that inherits from it. So you can have uh, chains of inheritance also. Uh, a parent-child relationship like this is often referred to as an ISA relationship. So if you have a class of a type cat, an object might be a main coon, which is a, an object, um, which is a type uh, class cat, which is a mammal. So that if you look at inheritance, you can um, actually uh, look at these hierarchies um, as in different ways. You have single inheritance, which is the top one. You can have multi-level inheritance. As I said, a cat, um, uh, well, the top one would be a um, <clears throat> uh, cat uh, is a mammal. Um, the bottom one would be a, um, a three-level inheritance structure where something is a something is a something else and it would inherit, C would inherit everything B provides um, which inherits whatever uh, A provides plus whatever it um, decides to provide. So C would have all the aspects of whatever <coughs> comes from B plus what came from A. Um, in the middle there, you've got what is called here hierarchical inheritance. Um, you can have um, different classes which are variations on the same parent class. Um, you could have, for example, if A is a class shape, B could be class rectangle, C class circle, uh, and D class triangle. So you see how those uh, all would have some common components but uh, would be different specializations. Now of the the other two, C++ happens to allow you to do what's called multiple inheritance <clears throat> and which is called um, hybrid or diamond inheritance. Um, um, in other words, C uh, in multiple inheritance would inherit things from both A, parent A, and parent B. And likewise, um, uh, the bottom one hybrid is, is another variation on that. Um, and in general, uh, whereas this is interesting from a theoretical point of view, people have found that um, in composing classes, uh, deriving classes from other classes, multiple inheritance and hybrid inheritance are usually bad things to do because they can lead to um, annoying errors and uh, all kinds of uh, gymnastics that you have to do to make them work properly. <clears throat> so even though these are in fact legal in C++, uh, people don't typically use them. Um, just to compare, for example, if you know Java, Java um, also does all this kind of inheritance, except uh, there is no such thing as multiple inheritance or hybrid inheritance in Java. Uh, it was purposely uh, never put into the language because of the problems that it can cause. But the other ones are very common. So here's an example of an ISA inheritance that's multi-level. So you have a mammal, um, and this is using that sort of uh, UML style class diagram syntax. The class name is at the top, the members are right below it, and then there's a line, and then there are the methods. So mammals, well, they can have many things, but they have an eyes. They usually, they have eyes, <clears throat> and they have eye colors. Um, and then a getter for the eye color, if you want to know what the getter for a particular mammal uh, object is, uh, and you want to know what co eye color they have, you have a public method called get eye color, which will return to you the current color. Um, and is a inheritance from that. We have two of them here. A dog is a mammal and a cat is a mammal, except they not only inherit eye color and um, the get eye color method, they also have things that are specific to them. Dogs bark, cats meow. 
<clears throat> um, likewise, uh, even more specific for a dog, a German Shepherd versus a Poodle, um, you have um, other uh, more specific things, but however, a German Shepherd would have a bark frequency and a bark method, and also an eye color and a get eye color uh, method. So as as would a Poodle, but the Poodle also has an is French versus the is German for German Shepherd. So this is a very common is a kind of inheritance. Is something we see all the time. Here's an example. Here's oh, here's an example of the shapes that I was talking about. So. Here is a uh, base class called Shape. It has a public um, uh, uh, set of uh, functions or methods that it exposes, <clears throat> set width and set height, so it has setters. Um, the protected, uh, protected here is like private. Uh, protected says it's not available to anybody um, uh, from the outside except uh, children inheriting from it they can get access to the height and the width. So in this case, the derived class is a rectangle, which is a shape. Um, it has um, something else besides <coughs> the, um, the height and width and the set height and set width. It's something called get area. So because um, rectangles have a width times height equals the area, uh, they are a special um, a version of a generic shape. And you can see the syntax there is the derived class uses a colon and then uh, public, um, well, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be public, but um, it typically is public um, uh, of the parent class. Here it's called shape. And if you look, there is um, the um, a separate main function in a, some other source code. <clears throat> There's a usage of that. There's a rectangle um, class which generates a rect object. The rect, you can set the width, you can set the height, and then you can um, get the area. And so you can see those are all public uh, methods which have been exposed by calling them public in the definitions. And um, the Set width and set height comes from the parent. The get area comes from the, the child. So very common. Another way of uh, creating new classes from existing ones is called composition or containment. Um, in fact, real life objects are composed of smaller, simpler objects in general. For example, car has a chassis, it has tires, it has an engine, it has a transmission, etc., etc., etc. Those are all um, other entities that could be classes of their own. The rule of thumb in general, um, um, well, amongst many people I'm familiar with, is to favor composition over inheritance wherever possible. It's generally thought to be a better design. Um, many cases you can have um, <clears throat> one or the other, depending on how you think about the problem. Um, but generally speaking, using composition like this is, is considered better style. Um, basically, what composition does is it uh, models has a, an owner relationship between objects. So a car has a muffler, it has a mirror, um, instead of um, uh, some kind of an inheritance association. The complex object <clears throat> uh, in composition is sometimes called the whole or the parent, and then the simpler objects, uh, object or objects are called the parts or childs or components. Um, now, important in composition, if the owner object ceases to exist, by definition, so do the contained objects when you're doing real composition of objects. <clears throat> There's a, a, a somewhat similar but slightly different concept um, of containment called aggregation. As opposed to what I just said about ceasing to exist when the owner ceases to exist, here, if the contained objects are really separate from the container, then that would not be true. In other words, they're not owned, they're associated or they're aggregated. I'll show you an example of, of what I mean by this. <clears throat> so, in effect, aggregation is a weaker form of association 
since there's no ownership involved. For example, university owns, okay, has a various departments, chemistry, physics, whatever, and each department has a number of professors. If the university were to close down, the departments would cease to exist, but the professors don't. They would simply move on to someplace else. They don't, they don't disappear. Uh, <clears throat> so you see that the kind of containment is different than um, in, in some other cases. So here, a university can see, be seen as a composition of departments, because that owns the departments. If the university is gone, the departments are gone, whereas the departments represent an aggregation of professors. Hopefully that example clarifies the, the difference. And you'll see both when you're doing um, uh, C++ programming. So in C++, you can use structs and or classes to include uh, other kinds of uh, structs and classes. Um, object composition is very powerful. It allows you to make more uh, complex things <clears throat> by combining together simpler things. Reduces overall complexity. Uh, which means you can write code faster and, and more error-free. And the nice thing is you can reuse code that's already written if you can manage to aggregate or compose um, a, a more uh, uh, complex class from a bunch of simpler ones <clears throat> because hopefully the simpler ones have already been tested and are available. Um, so here's a, a trivial form of composition. Uh, class car has a private member called uh, uh, motor. A motor is a pointer actually to a motor um, uh, class uh, object. The public uh, <coughs> uh, methods that are exposed, there is a uh, car which is the constructor for the class and the tilde which is the little squiggle car which is the destructor. Now, uh, in C++, you don't literally have to um, create a constructor or a destructor. They will be created for you if you don't specify them. But oftentimes, and generally speaking, I would recommend that you actually do add them to your classes um, because sometimes you do more than simply create a car object. Um, there might be a whole bunch of other things. So, for, so for example, in this case, <coughs> what you do when you create a car is you're not only creating a car object, you're also giving it a motor object um, which is embedded inside of it, uh, which would not happen if you simply had a default constructor. And likewise, and this is also a, a, a cleanup uh, kind of issue, is when you create a new um, uh, object uh, using the new syntax in C++, <coughs> those if you simply allow it to the class uh, object car to go um, out of um, scope and, and be destroyed by the uh, system, um, which is what would happen if it goes out of scope, um, the motor object would be dangling out there. The one that got created in the constructor would be dangling out there and never be accessible again. Um, and this would be... <coughs> <clears throat> a prime example of what is called a memory leak. Um, so you have to be careful with that. So um, another little C++ note. Generally speaking, for every class that you write, you should, even if it does nothing special, should always have a constructor of your own and you should always have a destructor of your own, even if there's nothing inside the braces special. Um, because someday there might be. <clears throat> so that's an example of composition. A uh, more complicated set, um, um, and this actually shows composition and, um, and other kinds of relationships. The black diamonds really are showing the composition. <clears throat> um, and um, so, for example, a customer is a user and an administrator is a user. So those are uh, standard inheritance. However, the other ones, um, a customer has orders. They have a shopping cart. An order has shipping info, uh, and an order has order details. So you see how uh, in each of those are classes or structs. I, oh, I, actually, in this case, they're uh, probably classes um, uh, that they're composed from. So um, 
that will give you a, a set of a uh, little bit more complex HAZA relationships. <clears throat> Here's another example of doing class composition. Um, so we've got a class X. Now these, these little uh, X and Y classes don't really do anything useful. Uh, they are um, syntactically correct, but they're kind of just simple little dummy examples. However, they are correct and they will compile and run. <clears throat> so we have two, um, uh, two files. We have a header file called useful.h and it defines a class X which has a, a member uh, I in it and uh, and you'll notice you don't have to say private because that's the default. Anything you want to make public though you have to make public specifically. So in here you have a constructor that's the X paren paren um, which sets I equal to zero then you've got a set method uh, that takes a value and sets it to uh, whatever you pass in and sets the value of i to that. It has a read <coughs> which returns the value of i and it has a permute which actually multiplies i times 47 and gives you that. So you see it really is kind of silly. It doesn't do anything uh, really useful but it does work. And if you look then um, that definition is then used as an embedded object inside of class Y, which is in a separate um, a CPP file. You notice the include of useful.h, so the definition is pulled over. Then in this case what happens is um, whenever a, a class Y object is instantiated, then it will have a, a data member of I and it will also have an embedded object X. And um, that uh, will be available <coughs> inside of any instantiated Y object. Then at the bottom is the main function. Um, simply all that does is it instantiates a Y object. Um, it sets the value of, um, um, it calls, um, the f method on uh, from that y object with a value of 47 and then it calls the permute um, <coughs> excuse me the permute uh, method from y also okay so that shows you a very simple example of composition in in action um, the last of these different important concepts that you'll run into doing your ADTs and data structures in C++ is called polymorphism and basically in a single phrase it's a single interface used on different data types. So what it, the idea is is um, when it's called overloading which means to use the same function or same operator to handle different data types um, you, um, the question is if, um, for example, in a basic C++, the, uh, the plus operator, the uh, addition operator, um, can take <coughs> different kinds of data types. You might not have thought of this very hard, but if you have a, uh, a float plus an int, that uh, it works perfectly fine. You wind up with a, because of the rules of how things work, you wind up with a float as an answer. Um, you can um, add together two floats, you can add a float and a double, you can add two integers together, etc. Um, that's an example essentially, uh, that's a built-in case of operator overloading. So, uh, but you can also do that with functions. So, uh, and the functions that you write in the class. If they have the same name, because really what you want to do is if you're going to, uh, if you go back to the shape um, definition um, where you had a rectangle and a circle and a triangle, what you want to be able to do, for example, is say um, uh, create a uh, triangle object and call get area. Or you want to be able to create a rectangle object and call its get area. Um, and uh, likewise with the circle. Now in fact how you compute the area of each of those different shapes is very different. <clears throat> so, but you don't want to have to write 
um, get area of circle, get area of rectangle. Get You simply want to be able to say something like get area and let the system figure out how uh, to know which one to use. So um, that's that's one example of this, this uh, problem. <clears throat> if you're doing this yourself, um, another example of this would be if you want to use the same um, uh, name um, on different data types, how does it know the difference? Well, usually what you do <clears throat> is each one of the, the functions, the method calls, should have a, what you call a unique signature. Um, it should either return different things or it should have different kinds of arguments or different numbers of arguments so that, in fact, the system can then tell which one to call under which circumstances. Um, so this ability in general is something called polymorphism. So the, the ability to either statically, that is, you can figure it out basically at compile time, or dynamically determine which version of a function to use. That's something intrinsic in um, C++ and Java and other similar systems. <clears throat> this has to do with something called binding. Um, that is, when is a variable and a function actually associated with something, um, some specific piece of code? Uh, so the binding time says, when does that actually uh, happen? When is that symbol bound to some code? When it's static binding, it happens at compile time. When it's dynamic binding, it happens at runtime. Polymorphism is a, a nice feature of systems like C++ that allow you to, to determine which, figure, uh, which function to use um, at runtime, which is, that's really what you want to be able to do. That's, that's a very useful thing. In C++, that's implemented as something called virtual methods, which we'll see uh, in passing later on, I think. And also, there's another variation on this, uh, which we definitely will see, which are called templates. Templates are a feature of C++ that allow you to um, have a, uh, for example, um, to, to be able to provide one of the major benefits I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, which is the ability to use the same data structure with different data types that is usually done using templates in C++. So in other words, if we have a, um, <clears throat> um, a stack, that's in fact yet another of those common ADTs that we're going to be learning about. Um, and a stack, um, you want to be able to have a stack of integers. You want to have a stack of my car objects. You want to have a stack of whatever and simply be able to use the features of that ADT uh, in the same way using the same terminology regardless of the kinds of data types that it's manipulating. So that's where templates are going to be coming uh, up later on. So summary, <clears throat> our processing models that we started with, the concrete data structures, those things are really the implementations of the specifications provided by abstract data types. Those ADTs are what define what kinds of data types these structures are working with, what's valid, what the range is, uh, what the behaviors are um, available to operate on those data types. So really a data structure to sum this up, is a way of physically organizing and manipulating data in a concrete way so it can be accessed and modified efficiently um, and so that it can meet the specifications uh, stated by the uh, abstract data type set of operations. So <clears throat> in uh, summary, learning ab about uh, what makes up these abstract data types, uh, which ones are commonly seen. I mentioned a, f a bunch of them already. Uh, what algorithms are used to manipulate them, the other algorithms that are used uh, along with them, like sorting algorithms, uh, how they're actually coded internally, and how to analyze their performance and compare different uh, data types against each other and different algorithms against each other are all part of what we'll be um, learning about the rest of the semester. So.
Thank you for listening. We'll pick it up from that point on.